Hey, Steve. How are you? I'm doing excellent. I want to start with congratulations on the movie. I agree with everybody else. It's fantastic. Thank you, man, so much. Thank you. Um, so I love throwing a curveball at the beginning. I have plenty of questions about the movie, but okay. if, if you could get the financing to make anything you want, what would you make and why? I'd want to get back into this project I've been developing when before COVID overwhelmed all of our lives, and it's a it's a it's a project about the about Freud. Um, I want to make a film about Freud, or actually, it's a, it was going to be a multi-episodic thing about twelve-part series, and I'll go back to it eventually. It just in the midst of COVID, everything sort of stopped. We didn't know what was going to happen next. And so I put it aside and I've turned my attention to some other projects that I had that are smaller scale, because this takes a lot of research time and, re, you know, and financing to get it going. It, it's sort of a write it first, but that's what I like to do. Oh, I have so many follow-ups, man. That's another, <laughs> for, an, for another day. Cause that is a huge, I'm, I, yeah, so many follow-ups, but um, so jumping into why uh, I actually get to talk to you, I think the best compliment I can give you about the film is that if Lou and the other surviving members were alive, I think they would be giving you very strong compliments because you captured their spirit with the way you told the film. And I sort of want to talk about the, the way you decided uh, to tell their story on screen and the aesthetic and the choices you made. Was it, how did you figure that out? Was it something that you figured out in the editing room or did you go in with that? It was, you know, it's, it, it really was, for me, it was my first documentary. And so it was true about documentaries that you are writing it as you make it in this way that I think for feature filmmakers, dramatic filmmakers like I am, is an astonishingly different way of working. And, and it opens up all kinds of unknowns and it puts you into this this, 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 the kind of process is everything. And every documentary is different. And we, we did have traditional interviews with interview subjects and we started the process with that. But then we had this incredible and unique collection of cinema, of images that come directly from the bloodstream of the 1960s of this exact time and place that was informing this band in ways that it's hard to find a, an, a parallel to when you think of other, you know, popular bands or music being this closely connected to a genre of, of cinema, of filmmaking, this specific, the avant-garde films of the 60s. And so that put us in a whole different kind of sort of temporal relationship with material that we created and material that we inherited that was going to be a searching process as how to tell the story. What I, what I really wanted was to feel like the images and the music were leading your experience as a viewer and, and that the oral history and the amazing interviews we had, and they were incredible, would have to sort of play just behind all of that. And that was a, that was a balancing process. And I think that whole goal is is uh was was sort of to your question about uh, it wasn't something i completely could have planned in advance i had guideposts but then you're kind of measuring it out as you go uh the interview with jonathan richmond is is fantastic and also i know that it's he doesn't do a lot of press so yeah. uh, what what was it like when he said yes it was it was again it was like hearing Mo Tucker say she'd do it. You know, it was just like, uh, I felt, and, and then people would say, how did you get Jonathan Richmond to say yes to be in your movie? I mean, people at Motto Pictures, who we partnered with on this film, who had tried to interview him for other projects. I think um, it was the combination of timing and that, that this felt like some, some people like, you know, Laurie and John Cale, and they had approved me as the director, as somebody who they wanted to trust the storytelling to. And so it felt like it was an occasion for, to maybe, you know, think twice about the normal reasons why you might say no or, or feel resistant. 
Um, that said, you know, we tried to get Doug, Doug Ewell to participate. We went back to Doug again and again and again. He just didn't want to do it. And you also understand that it's just at different times of your life. You're ready to talk about the past and other times you're not. And we're coming out of the, you know, Trump era. He's an environmentalist. He had his hands full with a lot of stuff he was involved in that felt pressing. And I, under, I understand that. I was just really disappointed. I really wanted Doug's voice in the film. Uh, I can't even imagine but uh, this the answer to this, but how much of a nightmare was it to get the clearances to use this footage because my God. Well, it was, it was, it, this is where I relied on so many amazing people. From the beginning, it was Brian O'Keefe, one of our archive producers, my partner, who really did the deep dive into curating the list of avant-garde films that would be the sort of master list that would go into our database. Then it was the amazing folks at Motto, Carolyn Hepburn in particular, who helped us get uh, temp versions of all of the films to put into the Avid so that Fonzie, Adam, and myself, my two editors, could all work on our Avids and have the material at, a, at, at our at, at hand. Uh, but then, yes, once we were getting close to locked pictures of the film, and this particular was particularly difficult during COVID because archives were not being manned or housed or staffed. So the process of going to all the various archives and getting the best masters of the material was a, and affording it. Uh, that was a real, and, and ultimately UMG, who were the company that started the whole thing by coming to me and saying, would Todd be interested in doing a, a doc on the Velvets? They ultimately stepped up and covered the overages for this film. So we were just... I just can't be more grateful for the people we put around ourselves and and the people who initiate the project by initiating it, by coming to me with it. Uh, I love learning. I love talking about the editing process because it's the final rewrite. And on a film like this, it's it's everything. So yeah. uh, the movie's about two hours. Did you ever have like a two and a half hour cut that you were like, I don't know how it's going to get shorter than this? You know, we we were... It wasn't, it, it, it probably, it began around two and a half hours. And then it was just continuing to hone it. And you, and you know, when you love your first cut, you're like, there's no way I can ever make it shorter. This happens with any movie. Any director will tell you this. And sometimes the decisions that you make, sometimes you go too far and you try to get too ruthless and, and bear down too hard on a cut. And you think, oh yeah, it's getting really you know, strong because it's shorter and faster and all that. And then you realize, no, you need breathing space. You need space to catch up and you need to catch your breath. And there's not a lot of places in this movie where you catch your breath. Here, here's the thing I have to say, though. The thing we always protected was the first act of the film that really takes its time in exploring the, the sources of the music. And the, it's probably the most experimental style of the filmmaking in the film, but it's because it's a lot of avant-garde ideas that we're swapping from artist to musician to artist and filmmaker and musician and so forth, back and forth. But um, we hung on to it and it puts you in a trance for this film. And of all the responses that we've been getting on the film, which have really been so great, even people who don't love it or have problems with it, they never mention the first hour of the film, let's say, being slow and dragging, like that draws you in, in a way that I feel really proud of because we always knew that was, you know, that was really setting the tone for this, for this film. Last thing for you, because I'm out of time. As a fan of your work, um, what are you going to do next? Do you know? I do. I'm working, I'm making my Peggy Lee film. Oh. Which is something that I've been, playing with and developing for a while and other projects have come in to intervene of course as they do but um i think we're finally lining up with all of the elements michelle williams is starring as peggy lee and it's an era of music i've never got you know never been able to descend into the jazz era and the pop era and you know the most remarkably 
complicated and interesting and brilliant musical subject. Um, and a woman who described a kind of sexual authority, you know, for her time and place that's pretty remarkable and set the standard for so many female artists that would follow. Uh, but also somebody who who struggled and and uh, and worked incredibly hard at achieving that sense of effortlessness that she depicted on stage. Can't wait! I'm out of time. Again, congratulations! I hope it's a huge. I hope everyone watches. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much, Stephen. It was a pleasure. Cool. Thank you. Take care.